Hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Tara Monter. I'm the event coordinator at Spacewatch Global, and I will be your facilitator today. So we have the wonderful opportunity to join forces with Laura for her event series about space arbitration. Her first event on whether or not outer space needs arbitration on the 13th of January was a great success with over 350 registrations. And on the 10th of February, she had another second great event discussing the need for an institution specialized in space disputes. So hats off and congratulations to Laura for now her third event organized by the Space Arbitration Association on the topic of if there is room for private parties in international space law. I will let her present the association and the idea behind the conference series, but a word on the Q&A function of the Zoom session. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the talk so please post all your questions in the Q&A tab that you can find on the lower end of your screen so, you, so we can take them into account. Uh, I would also like to mention that we are recording today's session. Last point before we start, please keep your messages in the chat to a professional and respectful tone, otherwise we will have to take action. Now, a short introduction of SpaceWatch Global. We are a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcast. And for all our fans of audio content, we also have new episodes in our Space Cafe radio on the road from conferences. And you can find them on all major podcast platforms. Just search for Space Cafes. We also like to keep our fan, fan shop online open for you to support us actively and become a space watcher. And if you've missed any of our space cafes, we have an archive available on our webpage in the events section and on our YouTube channel. Now, with this, my job is almost done for today and I would love to hand you over to Laura. Over to you. Hello everyone and thank you for joining again. So times in Europe have become a bit darker since we met for the last time so i'm i'm doubly glad, glad that we are able to meet today and for those who didn't attend the first two events just a word on on the purpose of the association so i founded the association to create a forum of discussion for the space law and the arbitration communities because i found that there was a lack of interaction between both and so we will we will organize eight conferences throughout this year discussing several aspects related to dispute resolution and outer space. And on the um, on the website, we have a list of articles um, that are dealing with this topic um, it tends or uh, the idea is to have an exhaustive list, so if you have written an article or you know of an article that is still not um, on the website, please send it to me and I will gladly add it. And this also brings me to the select selection of the speakers. So most of the speakers that are being invited to speak at these events are people who have already published um, on this topic. So that's how, how I select them. And before we, we delve into today's topic, just one word on the next event, which will take, take place on the 26th of April. And registration is already open on the website. And I will also post um, Put the link into the chat. So now with this, I want to thank Spacewatch Global and Kiara and Torsten for hosting the event series. And in case you're not familiar with their work, I highly recommend their newsletters. Um, if you follow them regularly, you, you will get a great overview over what's happening in the space industry. And I also want to, to thank Yosmundi and the international section of the New York State Bar Association that are, co that are sponsoring our events. So with this, um, we are turning to today's conference. And today's question is whether there's room for private parties in international space law. And I, it is my pleasure to welcome an excellent and above all, all female panel today. Um, we, we have Daniela Maria Rojas Garcia, who will provide an overview of existing international space law and its characteristics. Dr. Grace Nascimento, who will tell us about the need for transposing international space law into domestic law. Um, Rada Popova, who will address investment protection in outer space, and Rachel O'Grady, who will further delve into the role private parties play in international space law and how their position could be improved. I will, I will introduce each of them in more detail before they speak, but um, I will start with Daniela, who will be our first presenter today. 
So Daniela is a Colombian qualified attorney specializing in international transport law, and she has an LLM in air and space law of Leiden University. She is counsel to the Secretariat of the Colombian Aeronautical Authority and representative of the state of Colombia in the ICAOS task force to evaluate Article 12 of the Chicago Convention. Daniela has worked with the Civil Aviation Authority in preparing the position of Colombia in the UN Corpus in relation to suborbital and extraterrestrial flights. So Daniela, with this, um, we will now hear from you. Thank you very much for participating today. Hi, Lara. Thank you for your kind introduction and for organizing this event. Um, so for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to try to cover as much as possible of the general framework of international space law. Um, but I will try to focus especially on the need for regulation to start encompassing all kinds of actors, as opposed to just um, focusing on states and transfer some of that focus into pr the private sector. Um, so first, we need to remember that due to the importance of space and to the reach that these activities have, they were only initially performed by states. But this, so these activities became kind of a flag for the states and uh, a point of interest for all other states, uh, seeing how they progressed uh, uh, during the, the creation of space law. Uh, but with the passage of time and the development of accessible technology, private parties, of course, started to uh, venture into the space sector, and that is making us look into the original regulation to try to reevaluate it and, of course, to improve it. Um, I will begin by making a few comments on the five treaties that encompass or, or that uh, currently regulate space law from an international perspective. Uh, so first we have uh, perhaps the most important one, which is the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, it establishes the general principles applicable to all space activities, and they are framed under the, um, under the aim of peaceful and orderly development. Uh, the preamble of the Outer Space Treaty is based on the interest of all mankind in the progress of exploration and exploitation uh, of, of space and its resources. Uh, and it particularly recalls on the provisions that aim at avoiding space races, national appropriation of any portion of the state of, the, of, the, of space or the celestial bodies. And currently, it may be the, might be the most uh, overarching body of space law in place, which makes it the basis for the, the uh, development of the other treaties. Uh, the second one that we have is the Rescue Agreement that elaborates in Article 5 of the Outer Space Treaty. And remember that this provision considers astronauts as envoys of mankind. Uh, so this agreement aims at um, assigning in state uh, the responsibility to protect these envoys whenever they are developing space activities, and especially considering the humanitarian nature and the urgent character of return and assistance of astronauts, uh, regardless of their nationality. So it becomes kind of a responsibility for all states parties. Um, the third one that we have is the Liability Convention, which elaborates in Article 6 and 7 of, of the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, and these provisions make states internationally responsible for governmental and non-governmental entities that uh, execute these kinds of activities subject to each state's jurisdiction. So from the preamble of the convention, the regime is entirely victim-oriented, including the possibility for states to take precautionary measures to prevent damage caused by space objects that they launch into space. Uh, and it regulates for, uh, responsibility and liability in two different scenarios. So on one hand, we have a um, absolute reg liability regime for whenever damage is caused by the space object launched and into the surface of the earth. Uh, and we also have a fault liability regime that considers the scenario of liability when damage is caused between two space objects in flight. Um, but keep in mind that the liability convention uh, and the responsibility and the consequences from that uh, responsibility remain on states. So this responsibility doesn't necessarily translate into the private parties that are performing the activities. Um, then we have the Registration Convention, which is an elaboration uh, of Article 8 of the Outer Space Treaty, and it promotes registration of space objects launched into space under a centralized registry. This treaty is particularly important because it addresses a very important aspect of space law, which is registration that ultimately determines liable parties. So tracking the objects placed in outer space allows attribution between the space object and the corresponding applicable law. 
So that internationally recognized jurisdiction that stems from registration evidences that the state of registration ultimately retains control uh, and jurisdiction over the space object, over the personnel, and over any consequences that may derive from uh, the operation of the space object. This precisely this adjudication is what um, stems from Articles 8 and 11 of the Outer Space Treaty, uh, adding that from this obligation, all state parties have a correlative obligation to provide information on the nature, the conduct, the location, and any other relevant data uh, that the space object can have uh, and for the other parties. Um, the last uh, agreement that we have is the Moon Agreement which aims at preventing the moon from becoming an area of international conflict. And it is in this agreement that commercial exploitation of outer space was first addressed. So according to the moon agreement, all space activities are to be developed in a way that guarantees the nature of space and of the celestial bodies, uh, considering them as common heritage of mankind with peaceful purposes only uh, and fostering the progress in the exploration and use of outer space for the benefit of humanity. Um, so to make this really short, I'm not going to go into the different critics that cover uh, the Moon Agreement because it, it has been very controversial. Um, but keep in mind that this is one of the least ratified agreements uh, of, uh, related to space specifically due to different considerations such as political and philosophical or, and even eco economic considerations. Um, in fact, none of the states that are currently engaged or that have been, current, have been engaged in space activities or any of the spacefaring nations are parties to the Moon Agreement. But I think the fact that the Moon Agreement addressed matters relating to the environment and the prevention of damage uh, to the environment uh, shows the importance that the development of sustainable, uh, sustainable rules has in this sector. Um, so the treaties established this, this general framework for the development of space activities exclusively for peaceful purposes, and of course are part of the web of international public international law. So they are complemented by other relevant treaties, for example, um, the human rights uh, treaties and declarations, by the international uh, by international customary law and by general principles of public international law as established in the ICJ statute. And additionally, to complement these hard law international obligations, states have also aimed at developing principles that are adopted by the United Nations General Assembly. These principles currently um, uh, address matters related to general space activities uh, performed by states, the use of artificial earth, earth satellites for international direct bro television broadcasting, um, for remote sensing of the Earth from outer space, use of nuclear power sources, and the international cooperation that needs to occur between all states to develop these activities, particularly considering the needs for developing countries. Um, so I believe the, the central point of, of, this, uh, of this matter at the, in this conference should be that due to the focus on states, uh, uh, space law continues to currently lean very strongly towards regulation of space activities from a state to state pers perspective and through the lens of public international law. And this, the, this is the reason for states to be held internationally responsible for governmental and non-governmental space activities, for the need of private parties to achieve the state's authorization to perform these activities, and for the active state supervision of these activities when they are performed by private parties under the state's jurisdiction. Um, and this is not to say that the regulation from the state level is undesirable, because of course, we do need general rules that are applicable in the most uniform way. Uh, but in addition to these international state regulations, we need to promote the development of space activities from other actors, be them private or mixed or NGOs, or even financing parties, or a combination of all of these actors uh, in order to progress in the exploitation of, of resources and the exploration of outer space. Um, generally, I believe that the current framework is sufficiently flexible to enable and encourage states to carry out space activities in a somewhat orderly fashion. Uh, and I believe that it, believe that it should be uh, uh, sufficient to develop harmonic domestic laws that will promote space activities by private parties. So for these purposes and precisely based on this regime, uh, the international bodies have aimed at creating not only the general principles that should guide the industry, 
but also the soft law rules that are tailor-made uh, for the space activities specifically. And this should include financing, insurance, regional and bilateral relations, private liability, and as we will see later in this conference, uh, the dispute resolution mechanisms that are specifically tailored to space activities and that are av available to both public and private parties alike. So in general, the aim should be that states implement these commitments into their domestic legislations in the most harmonized way. Um, so to address the need for development of space law, considering all these new actors, the United Nations General Assembly has adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, for example, and it is based on the implementation of 17 Sustainable Development Goals and five main pillars, and on its part, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space has referred and continues to refer to a wide area of concerns that require not only regulation uh, in the sense that we create rules, but also in the regularization of activities that are a central point of interest of the international community. And these concerns include environmental and, and long-term sustainability matters, climate, climate change, space debris, confidence building measures, and disarmament and, and arms control. So to put how it is important that both the public and the private sector work jointly, uh, we can look at the example of space debris, which has been currently addressed in two, in various forms, but in two forms mainly. Uh, so on one hand, the committee has evaluated the possibility of uh, private parties to uh, to perform these cleanup activities uh, on the on the. Um, uh, to, to clean up the, the, uh, the earth from this space debris uh, under a, uh, an agreement for services or for the provision of services. But at the same time, the committee has looked into who is responsible for performing these activities, if it's the state or the private party directly, uh, how often these services needs to be provided, and what would trigger the obligation of states to ensure the provision of these services. So this is why I say that the performance of all space activities inevitably requires that all actors come together uh, from their different perspectives and add into the uh, regulation and the promotion of space activities. Um, so I, I think uh, this is all the time that we have for, for my intervention, but I hope that this short overview um, serves as a good starting point to develop this discussion. Um, I'm sure that private space activities will continue to go, grow very fast. So I believe that the best way to, to promote this and the development of space activities is for us to continue to have these conversations to ensure that the development of the law is in sync with technological advancements and with the more pressing concerns of the industry. Thank you, Daniela. You mentioned several space treaties. Um, and you also mentioned that space activities are growing very fast. So could you maybe say a word about the state of ratifications of the treaties in light yes, of the development of that we are seeing? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, not all space treaties have been widely ratified by states, uh, but the fact that the Outer Space Treaty has about 110 part uh, parties, and I think it has currently like 89 signatories, it shows the interest of the international community to abide by uniform, unified principles of international law in relation to space activities. Uh, but as I said earlier, the least ratified agreement is the Moon Agreement. It, I think it only has 18 signatures and about seven ratifications, and none of those belong to spacefaring nations or uh, nations uh, interested in lunar activities. Um, but the fact that uh, some of the provisions um, the fact that some of the provisions and uh, were addressing issues that we have today, I think it also shows the intent of the international community to regulate it. Particularly with the Moon Agreement, we have uh, that there, the interpretations of the provisions were uh, considered as prohibiting the use and of exploitation of and use of our, uh, of natural resources. Uh, on, or even a socializing space, which, for example, was a big concern for the United States. Um, this situation may have led to a lack of interest of states in entering into this agreement, uh, and also the fact that the agreement was prepared in parallel to the Law of the Sea Convention may have led to a sense of politicization uh, of the notion of common heritage of mankind, but in reality the intent was to offer a more specific regulation, which is an interest that we continue to have today. 
So probably the status of the Moon Agreement won't improve, uh, but we can take the lessons from the preparatory works, from the text itself, and, and from the critics that uh, stemmed from the text itself, uh, to further regulate the scientific and commercial operations in outer space. Yeah, I assume that with growing exploitation of space resources, this will become even more relevant in the next few years, and maybe there we, we can see more development in terms of the legal rules that are applicable. Um, and given that you're from Colombia, we all know about SpaceX and Blue Origin, but could you tell us a little bit about space and Latin America? Yeah, so space activities, uh, as we all know, are recognized as fundamental tools for economic and social and political development. Uh, and Latin American states have conducted space activities since as early as the 1960s, but all of these activities have been very modest and very small. Uh, and this is natural because the development of space activities is, can be has been traditionally expensive and may be seen as an unnecessary undertaking from the governments directly considering the economic and territorial disparity and the different issues that Latin American countries face. Um, so this is why it may be difficult for governments and politicians to justify the advancement of space programs in Latin America. Um, additionally, we have in the region a lack of fluid communication between, the, between states uh, or agreements in place developing um, uh, relations, particularly relating to space activities between the countries. Uh, so it's not that common to find Latin American countries coordinating these kinds of approach. Um, so for the development of space activities in Latin America, I believe that it should be more focused on private parties and on fostering the, the development of these kinds of projects. Um, as it happens with many disruptive activities in Colombia and in Latin America, Private parties uh, will probably see first the technological advancements, and those advancements will trigger the regulation by states um, in a way to catch up with, with the current industry practices. Um, I think Rada will touch on this later on, but investment protection today, I think, uh, is the greatest opportunity to develop these kinds of projects. Um, and international investors, of course, can turn into key promoters of space activities. So I would say that the injection of capital from foreign investments will, of course, facilitate the creation of these kinds of projects in, in Latin America. And it will be it will allow the the taking advantage of the geographical position of our countries uh, to better improve these these kinds of projects. Thank you very much. And just one last question be, before we turn to to Grace's presentation. Do you think that states will continue to play an important role in space activities, or do you foresee that space will be more and more the domain of just private activities? I don't think that we're going to see uh, such a dramatic shift in the sense that only private parties are going to engage in space activities. Uh, and I don't think that would be a desirable shift. Um, we need to consider that space, uh, commercial and scientific exploration and exploitation needs to be, be developed in a way uh, that will benefit mankind. And I believe the most natural approach would be to regulate it from all different perspectives and to have different actors um, performing these kinds of activities jointly or separately, uh, but finding a balance between the public and the private sector. Uh, so from the international perspective, uh, space, of course, represents the use of resources that cannot be appropriated uh, by any nation or by any pr private party, uh, and that their exploitation is capable of impacting everyone on Earth. So this makes space activities a global concern that needs to continue to have a focus on states to enforce international obligations. Uh, but at the same time, private parties have achieved such financial autonomy that space activities can be performed directly by them. And we see that with the current projects that are, have been undergoing and that are uh, in the news all the time. Uh, I believe that this interaction is highly desirable and we need to remember that states are not experts in technological advancements. So they shouldn't be tasked with managing, managing space activities because governments have more pressing issues to address. So I think we will have we will see currently an increase on private parties developing space activities, but always uh, jointly with the um, with the states that are going to continue to oversee them. Yes, I agree. Thank you very much. 
So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Grace Nacimiento, um, who will speak about domestic space law. So Grace is a lawyer and partner at GVW, Graf von Westfalen in Düsseldorf in Germany. She is co-head of the firm's digitalization and technology focus group, and she specializes in telecommunications law and regulation and in space law. She has over 20 years of experience in advising companies in the telecom and the space sector on a broad range of legal and regulatory matters. She has extensive experience in advising on national and international spectrum management issues in connection with satellite communication systems. She advises, amongst others, satellite network operators with respect to filings, spectrum usage, and coordination proceedings. And she's also the current chair of the International Bar Association's Space Law Committee and publishes regularly on space law topics. So now we will hear from her on domestic law and space activities. Thank you, Grace. Thank you very much, Laura. I'll try and share my screen. I hope it works. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it well. Okay, great. Just handling two screens, so give me some patience. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, Laura, for um, organizing this event and for having me. I'm happy to um, participate in this event. And um, I will take on the question um, that you put in, how important is the transposition of um, international space law into domestic law? Uh, Daniela just gave an excellent overview of the main um, of the main international treaties regulating space, and um, I come then in uh, to the question: Why is it important that um, international treaties are in, uh, transposed into um, national law? And maybe first of all, uh, to the question that is heading this whole event: um, Is there? Um, is there room for private parties in international space law? And I think Daniela already clearly responded uh, to that question. And I would uh, uh, join her in saying uh, the answer is a clear yes. Um, commercial and private space activities are developing fast and strongly. And so today uh, there are many private parties active um, in that sector. And um, sorry. So um, there is a need for a clear and reliable space law framework. And at the same time, those private parties are shaping a space law and policy at international and um, national level. There are basically two main topics that I would like to look at in order to give an overview of the main areas of discussion when it comes to the question uh, why it is important not only to transpose international space law into domestic law, but also, and that is essential, to have specific domestic laws governing space activities um, of private parties. So the first point addresses uh, the current market developments and the fact that there is a strong and fast growing private sector for commercial space activities, which definitely calls for an adequate uh, domestic legal framework. There is, as we will see, a fascinating variety of space related activities in the private sector. So against this background, I would like to take a look at why it is important, how national and how national space law is uh, shaped? Is it driven by transposition of international treaties or rather by interests and needs of uh, the private sector um, or maybe both? So let's take a look at what has been happening and is happening in the private uh, space sector, uh, which leads to the need to define and put in place an adequate legal framework that works um, for private parties. Uh, a main driver of this development is uh, definitely technology. So research and development of technologies to access space, to explore space and to build space-based business models, that is, why the that is what is driving um, the market. The variety of businesses is broad and covers many um, aspects. The activities and businesses in turn um, point to the corresponding legal issues that need to be dealt with in a legal and regulatory framework that applies to the private parties active in uh, the sector. 
just to touch upon a series of um, activities that are um, being developed in the, in the commercial sector. Space tourism, as you all know, that has gained quite some momentum with companies such as SpaceX and Blue Origin taking people to space. One of the first things that comes uh, to mind is what about liability? What if there is an accident? Would passengers be rescued in case of an emergency? By whom? So many open issues there. Space traffic management has become a big issue due to the sheer amount of objects flying in space and producing ever increasing risk of collisions. So there are startups that have taken up this issue and offer, for example, software based solutions to monitor and track space traffic and thereby help or assist users such as satellite network operators to manage the operations. So the question is, should there be binding rules how to manage space traffic that um, such startup would have to um, observe, just like we have road traffic regulations. Um, another field is an early detection and monitoring of wildfires or other natural catastrophes via satellite based technologies. Um, that is another example where you will find private startups offering their services. So, for example, what if images or data give um, faulty results as to where and in which direction fires are moving and um, what are the consequences? Are there any legal consequences? Um, again, many open uh, questions here for the parties who engage in that sort of activity. Then access to space is a, a growing private sector. Uh, Rada, who will be speaking next, works for a startup right in this field. They make space accessible for small and medium satellites. So question, for example, are there domestic rules governing the launch and potential damages caused by or during a launch um, uh, by a private party? We've heard from Daniela about the, uh, the, the international uh, rules um, addressed to states, but what about the private parties? Space ex exploration is another sector that um, I think we will see developing um, in the near future. Companies planning to conduct expeditions to other planets, extract resources uh, such as minerals or uh, water. Then we have the area of space debris removal. The question here whether private actors should also be responsible um, to mitigate space debris, remove objects uh, such as satellites when they reach the end of life. Um, there are private companies offering removal services. There is, for example, a commercial Swiss startup, ClearSpace, that was selected by the European Space Agency to carry out the removal of a space um, object. I think it's in, in the year 2024. Uh, so again, question is, should the states have domestic laws in place to regulate such activities for companies acting in their um, or out of their respective jurisdiction? Uh, then, of course, we have the broad area of satellite communications networks. Um, as we can see, private companies are moving ahead very fast to establish satellite communications networks. Just think of uh, Starlink established by SpaceX, Cooper by Amazon or OneWeb uh, led by a consortium. There are complex international and national mechanisms in place to as assign, for example, orbit position and spectrum usage rights, among other legal issues that um, arise here. And last but not least, Earth observation and satellite imaging in general. Um, what came to my mind when preparing this session was something that we are unfortunately seeing today, um, that is private company providing satellite images in times of crisis um, and war, as we are seeing now private companies being um, or providing satellite images to Ukraine um, to assist in detecting, for example, troop uh, movements. So should there be a domestic legal framework for the companies engaging um, in this type of activity? So now turning to the question, um, how is, or considering these private activities, how is space law governing those activities space uh, shaped or should be shaped? And uh, there are two aspects to it. Uh, one is the transposition of international treaties into domestic law. That is one factor, but 
as um, Daniela already explained, the treaties address states, not private parties. Nevertheless, um, there is a, a very important area where international the transposition and of international treaties um, has a crucial role, and that is the area of spectrum management. Spectrum planning has its legal basis in the International Telecommunications Union and is done at international level. Uh, the so-called radio regulations issued by the ITU amend the constitution and the conventions and they're binding upon the ITU member states. And since spectrum use is by nature cross-border and international, it is crucial that the relevant international instruments are transposed into national law that is specifically international spectrum planning um, instruments and um, mechanisms. When it comes to the commercial activities, we just looked at um, other needs and interests for legal regulations become apparent that should apply to the uh, to private parties active in the sector in order to give a reliable framework within they can move and uh, develop, their, uh, develop their business. Um, there's certainly the issue of approval processes, um, not only for launch and return of space object, but also of any space activity. Um, there are insurance requirements that must be uh, regulated. Some national laws have um, specific insur insurance requirements. Liability limitations, if you look at the consequences that, um, for example, uh, the, the launching of space objects can have if there is an accident, an, an accident, an incident, um, is the private party liable and to what extent? Um, space debris measures, uh, that is something that would have to be established specifically also in national uh, legislation in order to uh, guide private parties um, into a regime of um, protecting space by uh, taking space um, debris mitigation measures and oblige them to remove um, space objects after um, uh, end of mission or end of life. Uh, then, of course, every state has national security requirements that must be observed also by private parties acting out of the of uh, the respective uh, states. There are environmental protection issues uh, which should be regulated in national laws, penalties for non-compliance uh, with the provisions um, in domestic legislation, and um, last but not least, dispute res resolution mechanisms um, in order to address the conflicts that um, will definitely arise with the growing private sector between private parties and, and uh, states or between space and between uh, states, I'm sorry, and between uh, private parties. Um, the one risk that there is uh, when it comes to national legislation is um, the risk of fragmentation and of custom designed rules if each state go goes forward um, based on their own economic, financial, technical um, circumstances or situations uh, developing rules. Uh, so one important um, issue is how to harmonize uh, national legislation if it is to be um, a reliable framework for any private party um, acting in the sector. So here I would like to close my remarks, um, having hopefully giving you, uh, given you an overview on um, the um, on relevant issues when it comes to national legislation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, this was very, very interesting. Um, and I have one question. You, you speak about the risk of fragmentation, but do, do you see that as a risk that, um, that really affects your work and practice? Could you maybe give us an example of where this was a problem in your work? One example that comes to my mind immediately is, is uh, the, the authorization of uh, satellite communications um, networks. Um, you have um, the, the, the international filings, the international coordination processes, um, and the assignment of orbit rights, but you also have in each individual state um, certain spectrum usage authorizations. And um, what I saw when I worked for a, a company uh, establishing an, a satellite communications network, um, we were responsible for a territory of 20 European states. And in each state, we had a different um, authorization procedure, different requirements, different guarantees, uh, different forms, and so on. 
so that makes it very burdensome um, for an operator to um, establish um, uh, its network uh, without having to go through different proceedings in, in, every, um, in every state. Uh, what the um, EU at least had in mind at some point was a sort of a one-stop shopping uh, proceeding, meaning that at least within the European Union, you would go to one state, get an, a spectrum usage authorization, which would be valid uh, in every other uh, member state, but um, that never worked out. So this is still a gap, um, I think, in practice and which burdens uh, satellite network operators. So I guess it's good news for lawyers, but not so much for space <laughs> companies. Um, That's right. Another question I had um, when listening to, to your presentation was, um, so national law is transposing international rules into the domestic context, but are there examples of contradictions where national laws contradict international space law? Yes, um, there are. And a very recent discussion is uh, or has taken place in the area of space resources extraction. Um, for example, Luxembourg has a national law on the exploration and use of space resources. And uh, that uh, law states that space resources are capable of being owned by private parties. Um, in contrast to that, the Outer Space Treaty that Daniela uh, presented provides that outer space, um, uh, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by any means. Um, so a private party acting under the jurisdiction of Luxembourg could claim own ownership of space resources it extracted, while international law does not allow such appropriation by states and Consequently, a state would not be allowed to grant private, private parties in its jurisdiction the right to claim ownership of space uh, resources. So if that case arises in practice in the future, um, I think there would be a clear conflict between a national law and uh, the international treaty. Thank you. This is also a topic we will discuss more in April um, to see if this can give rise to interstate disputes. So just as a teaser for the next conference. And one last question, given that you're based in Germany, could you maybe say a word about German space law? Well, there is no German Space Act um, as of to date. Um, it has been announced for quite some time now, I think uh, for years. Um, so at this point, private startups acting in or out of Germany do not have a domestic legal um, framework. It may be an interesting question whether this is seen as an advantage in the sense of saying no specific space law related rules, that's good. Um, think, for example, of potential obligations regarding space debris mitigation or removal, uh, their international guidelines, but non-binding, whereas obligations under a National Space Act could be burdensome financially or uh, technically. Or is this seen as a problem if you consider issues regarding liability without any specific rules, uh, this may be a considerable risk fa factor for private parties. But in any case, in public discussions, uh, German industry is requesting a National Space Act um, in order to promote the private commercial space activities. Thank you very much. Um, it was very interesting. My pleasure. Um, we will now turn to Rada's presentation. But before I introduce her, just one word on the Q&A function. So please, any question you would like to have answered, please um, post it in the Q&A function. And I see that Mark Mayer already asked something, and I don't understand what AS rule makers are. So maybe before the Q&A session at the end, you could specify this a bit further. Thank you. And now um, we will turn to Rada, who will tell us a bit more about the protection of outer space investments. So Rada Popova is the General Counsel of ESA Aerospace Technologies, a German startup, and the first fully privately funded developer of launches in Europe. Previous, previously, Rada worked as a senior research fellow and lecturer in law at the University of Cologne, and has been a research scholar at the Center of Excellence at the Hague Academy of International Law. She has published numerous journal articles and book chapters on the regulation of space activities, and regularly lectures in universities in Europe and Asia. As a lawyer, she has provided expertise in various aerospace related projects with the European Space Agency, the German Aerospace Center and private industry in various countries. 
She also actively contributes to the work of the International Institute on Space Law and the International Law Association. At ESA Aerospace, she handles the fully, full variety of legal topics within the company, including infrastructure projects, launch services agreements, and other commercial contracts. So Rada, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, Thorsten, uh, for organizing the seminar. I'm happy to give uh, some insight on the applicability or the options to protect investments in space activities through the use uh, of bilateral investment um, agreements. Now, let me see whether the screen sharing function, which, which somehow troubles everyone, is working well. Just give me a second, please. Hmm. Let's see. I think I'll skip my title slide. For some reason, it's not showing. But I hope you can forgive me that. So in general, why do we look at the topic of investment protection for space projects? Um, more or less, everybody are used to look into the legal and regulatory side of space activities more from the international uh, perspective. As we know, for more than 60 years, and this has already been mentioned, there are five treaties um, on space law, and this is until today, the legal regulatory basis which governs the use of outer space, be it through governmental entities or by private actors. At the same time, uh, we are also living exactly in the time where the so-called new space, very often compared to the Apollo era, uh, is now turning the stakes in the sense that not only more and more private actors are involving and engaging in space activities, but where the private space industry is extremely, uh, has extremely grown over the years, and um, investment undertakings in terms of uh, private financiers investing money in, in startups, in space startups, but also mergers and acquisitions of space companies are taking place. So that we see um, a very large amount on the one hand of funds being put into space activities. And on the other hand, of course, a growing risk for all those non-state based parties uh, coming from the private sector uh, to, to carry out those activities and, of course, bear all of the associated risks. So also, when we look into the nature of space activities, um, it is easy to see uh, that they are an example of a very large scale, long term type of activity, which requires the allotment of quite significant financial resources, extensive planning, and normally, such activities can neither be planned over a short period of time. They require um, a few years, normally, of preparation, of technological development, also of uh, finding the necessary funds. And they are projected also to, to, um, to take place over normally over decades. Although now, with the um, evolution of smaller satellites, we know that the lifetime of a space mission, if we look into single satellites, uh, is actually being diminished from the classic 10 to 15 to 20 years of larger satellites, now going down to maybe four, five years. In any case, um, as we have already heard also in the previous editions of, uh, of this seminar or conference, um, it is quite an unsatisfactory situation with the regard to options for dispute settlement in international space law. It is based on traditional diplomatic protection, meaning that states would be the main actors to engage into uh, dispute settlements. At the same time, the involvement of private actors calls for uh, more favorable protection standards, for more pro uh, favorable options for arbitration, and also not in the last place, and this is what we're going to talk about, um, for favorable protection standards for the investments uh, put into space activities. Now, um, of course, from the perspective of private companies, it would be very beneficial if they could rely 
on the application of investment treaties to, 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 to fight against interference with their rights by the states. Because despite the commercialization of space activity, states do remain, and this has been mentioned before, do remain heavily involved in space activities. Uh, the more the simplest example is that even though a state may not be directly involved into the planning or the carrying out of the, sp the space activity, launch facilities, for example, are all, always located in state territory or in the classic case, and normally depend also on licenses and authorizations issued by the states. So that the risks for a private investor in a space activity and for the private company carrying out this activity may range uh, not only or may, may start of course with a financial risk in the success of the operation but it may also involve the risk of um, not finding a stable investment climate under which it can operate uh, it may also concern for example the uh, legal uncertainty that grace was just mentioning uh, private companies operating in states which do not have a national space law for example uh, sometimes results in a certain level of regulatory uncertainty and deficiency, which is not necessarily uh, wished for by the private actors. But now coming back to the requirements that must be met for investment protection to be applicable to investments made in space projects. Two main conditions must be met. First of all, there must be an investment, meaning that the economic activity or the space project, as we may call it, um, containing numerous phases, must qualify as investment in the sense normally used in bilateral investment treaties and under the exit convention um, in the application of the so-called double keyhole principle. Now, there is actually no universally applied definition of investment. Um, for example, the US model bid from 2012 refers to um, every asset that an investor owns or controls, be it directly or indirectly, that has the characteristics of an investment. Now, if we try to apply this um, to space activities, we, we, we can quickly conclude that a space project, as, it, as I mentioned, a long-term, quite costly um, undertaking, it involves also uh, acquisition of uh, sometimes a fixed infrastructure, acquisition of uh, movable property of technological development, of hiring personnel. So it's a quite high um, scope, let's say, of, um, of transactions and forms of investment. Additionally, in applying the double keyhole approach, the economic activity uh, must also fulfill the definition of investment under the exit convention, meaning that it has to fulfill three criteria. Um, the three criteria are my next slide. Contribution, duration, and risk. Now, again, as I mentioned, the duration is given because of the inherently long term of, of a space activity uh, from planning to carrying out to end of life. The contribution is also substantial for the uh, investment reasons that I just mentioned. And the risk is also given. Uh, we may differentiate between different types of risk, uh, on the ground risks, namely when talking about finding the proper location, uh, organizing the activity, having to fulfill the licensing requirements or authorization requirements posed by the state and so on. But also we talk about significant risks in terms of everything that can go wrong with the space activity in orbit. Space debris is just uh, the, the most important example, but of course, ASAT testing uh, can be a reason why a space activity can go wrong. So um, to answer the question, is there an investment or do space activities qualify as an investment? The answer is yes. All of the prerequisites are given. And even if um, we consider that a further requirement must be given, namely a contribution to the economy of the host state. This also will be given in most cases as, um, as I said, already planning and uh, organizing, setting up the infrastructure for carrying out a space project 
means that uh, the state in which this activity is being organized normally benefits both economically, but also for uh, reasons of prestige. Now, the second main requirement that must be met apart from an investment is the fact that um, there must be a host state. And this is actually the more problematic uh, prerequisite to be fulfilled. First, uh, the nature of space activities is not just complex technologically or economically. It has an inherently multinational nature. We, we will be seeing less and less space projects, which from start to end are organized under the jurisdiction uh, and the influence of only one state, where, for example, let's say, um, coming from Germany, I'll use a German example, where the company is registered in Germany and fulfills and carries out all of the activities under um, German territory, under uh, German law. Already, due to the lack of a national legislation in Germany, this example is practically nearly impossible. And also because of the need to combine efforts both uh, on the technological level, but also on the uh, financial level, normally space projects involve the participation of more than one state. It, it may be multitude of states. And here comes the question of how do we then define which of all those states is the host state? Because in the end, the host state is the one that carries the duty to protect the foreign investment. Now, there are different options and uh, hence different, um, yeah, different possibilities to, to have a host state. Uh, actually, it seems impossible to identify just one single host state for the entire space project. This is why uh, we can maybe resort to the approach which differentiates between different phases of a space activity uh, and differentiates in any case between the on-ground part of a space project and then the on-orbit part of the space project uh, because for each of those parts, uh, there are different types of connections to states. For example, in the pre-launch and the launch phase, most likely there will be a very close territorial connection to the state in which the infrastructure of the company is based and from which the space object is to be launched. Or for example, the, the, the state on whose territory the manufacturing process is taking place. It's a bit different in the on-orbit phase. It has been mentioned before that when space objects are in space, they are actually orbiting in an area that is free from sovereignty. Uh, it cannot be compared to any national territory. And the only e expression of state sovereignty uh, takes place through Article 8 of the Outer Space Treaty. Namely, uh, the state of registry has the jurisdiction over the space object. So in this sense, in the on-orbit phase, uh, a given satellite or any space object does not have, of course, a physical connection to the territory of a host state. And there, the jurisdictional nexus exists between the space object and the state in which it has been registered, because there, is, uh, there should be only one state that registers a space object. This constellation is more the, simple, the simplified version. Um, international space law does not tackle or regulate cases where the ownership over satellites um, is transferred. So basically, uh, under space law, once a launching state, once a state of registry, you remain a state of registry, although space assets, of course, uh, undergo transactions and undergo change of ownership. And so far, this problem is solved on the basis of bilateral agreements between the previous owner and the new owner. But additionally, we must say that the evaluation of the nexus between the space asset or the space project and the given state to be considered as a host state should also take into account the fact that satellites in general and space activity in general, other than other investment activities on the Earth, are not meant to be located within any territory. They aim to go and operate into outer space. Therefore, um, this nexus or this link taking place through Article 8 of the Outer Space Treaty seems quite reasonable in the sense that it interprets the requirement of 
taking place in the territory of the host state uh, through the exclusive jurisdiction over the satellite. On the other hand, um, if we go back to the problem or with the issue of uh, on the ground host states, there we may have actually, in fact, in, uh, in parallel and few options for a host state. But this again is within the sense and within the logic of international investment law, which seeks to offer protection of foreign investors, not just against one optional host state, but um, it seeks to offer the, the foreign investor to seek for protection against numerous or a, a few possible host states. I already talked about the different phases. Um, I just want to give you a brief outline of what are the main risks from an investment law perspective during each of those main phases. Normally we can differentiate, as I mentioned, between Rada, Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but if you could just give a very quick overview because Absolutely. we are running off, out of time. Thank you. Have to. Yeah, sure. So the main risk basically during the pre-launch phase, everything that takes place on the ground lies mainly within the regulatory uncertainty. What if the state does not issue the license on time? What if the state changes the legislation and so on? These may result in frustrated costs for the investor. During the launch phase, uh, which is the most risky one, um, it concerns the physical security of the uh, space object. In this case, the FPS principle is important. And in the on-orbit phase, uh, it is very difficult actually to apply a very strict standard for states under uh, FPS, because it's a due diligence duty, uh, where the risks may stem from collisions with space debris, ASA testing, and so on. But in general, just to wrap it up, um, we, can, we can find out that investment law is indeed very well applicable to space activities. And I absolutely concur with the opinion that it, it has a huge potential in uh, allowing for investments and highly expensive activities to be better protected than they are currently are under the more or less fragmented system between international space law and uh, partially existing national law. Thank you for the attention and happy to address any questions. Yes, I have, I have one short question. Um, so a lot of satellites have a dual use function, meaning that even though they are made for commercial purposes, they can also be used for military um, activities. So how do you think that fits into investment protection? How, how can that be addressed? Yeah, so the dual use, as we know, is one of the most basic characteristics of any space asset and space activity, and it involves uh, actually national security concerns. And as we know, national security concerns may serve as a reason for a host state to put some limitations or barriers for commercial investment. Um, so in any case, uh, we can say that the dual use character of space assets may lead to certain or to the realization of political risks in terms of investment. Thank you very much. There are many more questions we could ask, but because of time reasons, I think I will now turn to Rachel. Thank you very much, Rada. It was very interesting. Um, so last but not least, it is my pleasure to introduce Rachel O'Grady, who is one of the, the main authors of space arbitration articles in recent years. Um, so as, as an introduction, um, Rachel is a partner in the international arbitration practice at Maya Brown. Um, she is a solicitor advocate and focuses on international commercial and bilateral investment treaty arbitration and public international law. She's also co-founder and co-chair of Maya Brown's space and satellite group and has acted for commercial parties and various space related disputes. Rachel um, has a particular academic interest in the loss of outer space, and she is increasingly uh, becoming increasingly well known for, for these topics. She has written several articles on space law and space arbitration and has been quoted extensively in the press, including in the Financial Times, The Guardian and The Daily Telegraph, among others, and she has been interviewed on BBC Radio on space arbitration. So Rachel, we're now looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Laura. I'm going to start with the dreaded, the dreaded moment of the screen share. So if you bear with me, I will do my best. 
to do that. And perhaps you can just confirm whether you can see. Yes, we can I see can it. See. Okay, perfect. Uh, actually, now I've lost the bit where I can change it. Let's see. Sorry, I've lost. Oh, yeah. Can you see that if I change that? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, well, um, so thank you very much for having me uh, here today. Um, I'm going to address um, how private parties, in light of everything that we've heard, how private parties might be able to resolve their space related disputes um, to the extent that they end up in one. Um, and I think to start with, um, just to recap what we've heard, I think it might be useful to just recall the fact. Um, that there are various international and domestic legal orders which may apply. So Daniela described the international legal framework, which operates at the overarching level. So that's the space treaties, the outer space treaty, um, the liability convention, um, and so on. Um, and then Grace described um, how that is incorporated into domestic um, jurisdictions around the globe from top down, for, so in, incorporating the international legal order into domestic space law, but also from the bottom up, so the development of um, domestic space law um, in various jurisdictions around the globe. Um, now, it's important um, for the sake of my discussion to bear that distinction between the international legal order and the various domestic legal orders around the globe. Um, it's important to bear that distinction in our minds. Um, and that's because the way in which space related disputes are resolved uh, will depend on which of those legal orders is applicable um, in the specific circumstances of that dispute. Um, so as the level of activity in space um, increases uh, as it is, I think there are four categories of space related disputes that may arise. So, and, and they kind of span this spectrum. So on the left-hand side of the spectrum, um, so the left-hand side of this, um, this slide, you have state-to-state -state disputes. So those are kind of pure public international law disputes, which arise purely under the international legal order, under the space treaties, so between states. And they are resolved um, by diplomacy, possibly the ICJ, if, they, if the states consent to its jurisdiction, possibly under the Claims Commission foreseen by the, by the Liability Convention, um, possibly via state-to-state -state arbitration. And many of the uh, intergovernmental agreements in this sector um, contain arbitration clauses, uh, like the ITU founding agreement, the ESA founding agreement, et cetera. So it, it, in brief, for state-to-state -state space-related disputes, various recourses exist um, before which those disputes can be resolved. If you go to the other end of the spectrum, so you've got commercial space disputes or space industry disputes, as, as Jan um, described them in the first of these webinars. These are disputes between two commercial parties in connection with a space related venture, but they are governed by domestic law at the domestic level. So they would arise normally out of a disputed contract. So, for example, a contract for the manufacturer of a spacecraft component or a contract for, for a launch uh, of a satellite. Um, and they can be between two commercial private parties or they can be, be between a state um, on the one hand, but acting in a commercial capacity and a private party on the other hand when they have entered into a contract. Um, but, but they are essentially, they're contractual disputes. So they'll be governed by the law of a particular jurisdiction. Domestic law will be applied. And so those sorts of disputes will be resolved either by courts, domestic courts, um, potentially by arbitral institutions, if there's an arbitration clause. Um, and there may even be, uh, you know, there are other space specific fora available, like for example, the Dubai Space Court. So again, for those kind of disputes, um, I would argue that adequate uh, and, and very good um, dispute resolution mechanisms and fora exist um, before before which they can be resolved. Then moving along um, one step to the left, so private versus state disputes, um, as we've just heard, and so investment treaty disputes. So tr 
disputes which do not arise out of a contract, um, but which are caught nevertheless by um, terrestrial investment treaties. Um, so where a foreign investor has gone to the territory of a foreign host state and where that host state has taken measures to harm those investments. And as a result of that, the, the, the harmed private investor itself is entitled under the applicable treaty to a direct recourse against that host state via arbitration. Um, now, the problem arises then where the red question mark is. Uh, so when disputes arise between a private commercial entity on the one hand and a state on the other hand, but that dispute, it doesn't fall under a contract. Um, it doesn't fall under the parameters of, um, of an international investment treaty, uh, for example, because it's not in the territory of the other host state. And I'm very interested um, in what Rada had to say about the jurisdictional nexus um, being linked with the, with the registration, but we can discuss that perhaps at another point. But there, are, there will be situations for sure where uh, disputes arise and they don't fall under any of those parameters. So what then does a private entity do? Like what recourse does it have? And I thought just to take, just to kind of put it in, in context, I thought just to imagine a couple of examples. Um, now you'll all be familiar, I presume, with the what happened with uh, the Chinese space station and Starlink. I think it was just before, just after Christmas. Um, if just for the sake of this example, we can flip that on its head. Now let's imagine that the Chinese space station had somehow come too close to a Starlink satellite or a Chinese satellite had come too close to a Starlink satellite and perhaps even collided with it um, and caused damage to the Starlink satellite. So then Starlink could have a direct claim against the Chinese state. Um, or if we go to the right hand side of this slide and take it one step further, let's take out the state entity. Let's presume that no state entity is involved. Let's, for the sake of the, this example only, let's presume that, um, that, for example, OneWeb and Starlink had two satellites and the OneWeb satellite crashed into the Starlink satellite. Now, OneWeb is a UK uh, incorporated um, company and under international space law, as we've heard, uh, sorry, states are responsible for the, the activities of their nationals in space so that would then make the potentially make the uk government liable for the potentially wrongful activity of OneWeb, which caused it to crash into the starlink satellite so then in that scenario starlink would have a claim potentially against the uk government either way you end up with a claim that's not governed by contract not governed by a treaty but it is between a private entity and a state so what then um and just to say as an aside and i've seen some of the questions in the boxes there are lots of very complicated and complex areas and arguable gaps in international space law as to how substantively those disputes could be resolved. Um, but I'm not covering those today. I would love to, but I, but I don't have time to. But I just want to flag that they exist, those substantive gaps. Um, and therefore, the ground for these kinds of disputes is very fertile, especially as increasing commercial space activity is taking place. But I'm, I'm talking here about the procedural gap. So the fact that there isn't actually any forum at all before which private entities in these scenarios can bring claims like these directly against potentially liable states. So not only are the rules themselves missing, but there's also nowhere to go when that lack of rules or that lack of regulation um, does cause a problem. There's nowhere to go to argue about it. There's no court. There's nothing that provides for arbitration in the space treaties. They're silent on dispute resolution, apart from um, the liability convention, but um, that only provides for a claims commission for states. Um, and in any event, it's not binding. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So even the few rights that do exist can't be enforced. And when there's a gray area, um, there's not really a way of resolving that confusion. So this essentially mirrors the exact situation that existed in the 1960s with respect to foreign investment disputes. So before the ICSID convention had come into force. And at that time, um, foreign investors were wholly dependent on their own governments 
accepting to take on and pursue claims on their behalf through diplomacy. And the investor or the private entity in question wouldn't actually have any control over the proceedings and it would be relying on the state to do it for it. Now, the ICSID Convention totally transformed that status quo because it granted private investors with a direct recourse against foreign states um, in the event that rights pertaining to their investments under international law were harmed. And I would argue that with the acceleration of the commercial space industry um, and the surge of this extraterrestrial activity by private entities and individuals even, um, I would argue that the time has now come for a similar facility to be created with respect to outer state disputes between private entities um, and states, which now arise on the international legal plane. Um, now, I'm just looking at the time, yes, um, very quickly, 25 years ago, Professor Karl Heinz Bocksteigel um, thought about this, and he actually led a task force to produce a draft convention on the settlement of disputes related to outer space activities. And it was a very comprehensive instrument which was produced and adopted, in fact, by the International Law Association um, in Ta Taipei at, the, at its 60th um, conference. The problem is nobody ever signed up to it. Um, so we're left without anything still. And I, that may be because um, of some of the perceived drawbacks. For example, it didn't provide for a seat of arbitration or an ad hoc process like in the Exit Convention. So that arguably may have been things which, which could have been improved or, or it may have just been before its time because it's only recently that things have really boomed in the commercial space industry. Um, but I, I would say that the time is now ripe for some kind of ICSOD or an international convention on the settlement of outer space disputes. Um, and while updating space law as a whole and substantive space law might be a bit of a challenge too far, given the different stages of development and political agendas of different nations, um, I would argue that we should at least be trying to work towards the creation of a dispute resolution forum which is neutral um, and which private uh, spacefaring operators can have access. Um, yeah, so I think given that how fast things are moving uh, and given that this sort of instrument will take time to develop, uh, I think it should, it should be um, something that we should all as lawyers, as operators in the space industry be taking very seriously. So I'm going to end there because I'm very aware of the time. Thank you very much. But I have one question. In, in, in your view, um, why did the convention suggested by Professor Bergstiegel not have more success? And why do you think states would sign up to an exit convention now? Um, so to, to answer the first question, so, so sort of taking it in parts, personally, I think that the reason that um, states didn't sign up. I, well, I think it's sort of for both of the reasons that I mentioned. Maybe it was before its time, because in 1998, I, I know obviously, um, the, you know, the space industry was in existence and very much operating, and we were already very dependent on satellites, etc. But I mean, it's only, for example, in recent years where low Earth orbit has become so real and congested, and um, I think it, it's only been brought into focus. The, the real need for it has only been brought into focus more recently. Um, also, I think, as I mentioned, the fact that um, the, the draft convention, I think, could be um, evolved to a certain extent, given that the, essentially, I mean, without getting into the complexities of it, there was no, um, no kind of right to appeal. And although there is no right to appeal in arbitration, ICSID does provide this ad hoc system, or uh, if you're seated in an under trial arbitration, for example, you will always have recourse to the domestic courts to challenge and award whereas in the draft convention none of that existed so you're very much kind of at the whim so to speak of, of the tribunal that was appointed but so that's potentially why it wasn't signed up to those two reasons um why is the time ripe now i think again i think we're we're entering into a new phase of commercial space activity um and i think we have a, a very limited 
um, window to act now because because of the congestion, especially in low Earth orbit. Um, and I would just say that again to draw an analogy with ICSID, that it, the ICSID convention was created preemptively as well. It, when it was created, there were only about fifty BITs in force. Now there are over three thousand. So it was put in place before those before investment treaties really existed or, or lots of them existed but it was created and then those bilateral agreements were concluded and because it existed it was incorporated within them um, and that's kind of how it took off and we see now the artemis program by new bilateral agreements being concluded um, in the space sector between between nations between states and if there were some kind of forum like this then just as ICSID clauses, arbitration clauses were included in bilateral investment treaties, a similar clause could be included in the new generation of space treaties, which I'm sure we're going to see over the next few years. Yes, actually, investment laws also are very fragmented, and even though it's, it somehow works, no? So that was two questions in one, but mm -hmm. I have another one for you. Sure. Um, yeah, already turning to the Q&A um, function. There's a very interesting question about customary international law. So the, the question is whether customary law can be created by private parties in space because they are supervised by states. So can I answer that? Is that for me? Um, so I think absolutely. I think um, especially given the difficulty of, I think it's going to be so difficult, unfortunately, to come up with um, a new binding multilateral global in a new outer space treaty basically given the different agendas of all the states that would have to be unanimously um, in agreement to conclude one i think um customary international law will develop um i think it will develop principally through the creation of all of the soft law instruments that we're seeing um crop up because because they are the soft law is obviously easier to conclude than hard law so we're seeing as as i think it's been been mentioned um, soft law relating to space debris we're seeing um, soft law relating to the sustainability of space to the to the environmental impact of, of space operations and I think the more soft law that develops and the more adherence to that soft law I think in with time that will evolve into customary international law and those principles will evolve into customary international principles um, also I think um, with the increase of definitely investment treaty disputes which are public um, and potentially if, the, if some kind of dispute resolution forum is created I think the jurisprudence of the tribunals again like happened with ICSID the jurisprudence that is created will also then end up shaping um, customary law but it takes time. Thank you very much I don't know if someone else wants to add something to this but I will already turn to the next question um, on whether the flex of convenience in various jurisdictions I mean, more lenient rules in some countries than in others um, are creating conflicts and how those could be prevented. Maybe, Grace, just turn off your camera. <laughs> I thought this question could be directed to you. If not, maybe someone else can, can address this. Daniela, maybe do you want to say something about this? Well, I believe that there's a risk of, of that kind of situation emerging and i think uh the only way to resolve it is by practice i think it's it's a little preliminary to find a clear-cut solution to that problem at this stage because only right now you're seeing how uh the private parties um, actually engage in these kinds of operations and then they will think about um how they are going to venture into the jurisdiction of each state to perform the, those activities so i don't think uh, there will be a clear-cut explanation here or a, or a solution to, to address that matter. I would only say that we need some time to allow the, the development of, of the practice uh, to find a solution. Although, if I can add, it, it might work as a disincentive for states to enact stricter rules because then the investment will just go to countries where there are less rules imposed on them. No? So maybe it's a bit like forum shopping and investment law to the extent that you will go where the legal rules benefit your investment most so um 
And then there's one other question on the benefits of a potential model law in space law. I don't know if any of you would like to say something about this, Rada. Uh, maybe on that topic, because we just mentioned the efforts of the International Law Commission in terms of dispute settlement in outer space. Actually, this law association has already produced a model law, the so-called SOFIA model law, um, back in 2012, I believe. Uh, and it should serve for all countries that are aiming at creating their own national space legislation. Um, it is a set, basically, of uh, a dozen of rules with a short commentary below explaining the rationale. So such a thing already exists, and I do believe it's quite beneficial, especially for newcomers on the uh, space scene, let's say, because other than well-experienced space powers, which have already created comprehensive uh, legislation, it is quite difficult for newcomers to actually produce something that is well adapted to the actual state of their industry. And on the more regional level in Europe, I think the European Space Agency is also, uh, without having it formalized as a model law, I believe they are also supporting or at least offering support for states who are looking into uh, becoming one of the states with national space legislation. That's very interesting. Do you know if the model law has been accepted by states? Have states already used it? Uh, I think it is widely used, but it, it, it is actually not um, meant, I think, to just be directly just taken over. It exists. Mm -hmm. um, states can consult it and can use it really as a model when they mm -hmm. draft their own law. And um, I can't quote names of states, but I believe uh, it has close proximity to a number of newer space legislation. So it seems to be used. Okay, thank you. Grace is back. I don't know if you yes. want to add something. <laughs> thank you. I'm sorry. I don't no, know what no. happened. Um, on the model law, um, that was something that was under discussion or is still under discussion in Germany, whether that could be a basis um, for the National Space Act. But it's th th there seems to be a, a majority saying that um, Germany needs to take in the specific um, national circumstances, which of course contradicts the, the idea of having a model law which is harmonized um, over as many countries as, as possible. So what we see here is that there is a reluctance to uh, rely on a model law with the argument that um, it does not reflect really the specific national circumstances that need to be um, uh, reflected in the law economically, technically, socially, and so on. Um, but uh, in, in the long run, it would certainly be beneficial um, to um, have an orientation on such a model law uh, in the sense that um, newcomers would have a reliable or more or less a reliable guidance on how to um, build up their business, not only in a specific jurisdiction, but also um, extending um, to other jurisdictions. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. I hope the audience as well. Thank you again very much to all of you for participating. And I'm handing over the microphone back to Kara for her closing words. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you all so, so much for this very inspiring talk. Um, before we finish for today, I would like to give a brief rundown of our next upcoming event from Space Watch Global. So tomorrow on the 25th of March, we have our next Space Cafe Germany um, with our guest presenter, Markus Muslechner, who will be talking to Dr. Ernst Pfeiffer, and this will be in German. And then, of course, what is on the slides here, not to mention, uh, not to forget to mention, Laura already said it before, that the next space arbitration event will be on the 26th of April on the topic of should we expect interspace, interstate space arbitration. So uh, there's, it's already on Eventbrite, you can sign up. Then next week on the 29th of March, we have our next 33 minutes with Laura and Edward, where we will tap into Laura's passion for sustainability, innovation, human thriving in space to discuss the thoughts of future of space exploitation and space earth collaboration. Then on the 1st of April, we have another white label event uh, of the Working Group for Development and Humanitarian Aid on the race against COVID, health systems and humanitarian aid. Then on the 6th of April, we will have our next Space Cafe Italy by the wonderful Dr. Emma Gatti. And on the 7th of April at 4 p.m. CST, we have our next Space Cafe Mariba's Vox Populi. So stay tuned. All events are going to be online on Eventbrite.
As always, we love to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up for our daily and biweekly newsletters. And if you want to treat yourselves to something special, become a Space Watcher today or help us out in the Supporter Program. We would really appreciate that. So again, huge thank you to Laura for another fantastic event and thank you to all your wonderful guests for the inspiring talk. I hope that you all stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us and for asking so many great questions. I hope to see you in the next week. And in the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a Space Watcher. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.